Welcome to the People's Law School. This is a program put on by the Alabama Association for Justice, the trial lawyers. And I want you to know that we've been doing this since 1985. These are filmed up here in Huntsville, Alabama. But uh, uh, we bring to you the best lawyers, certainly, that Alabama has, and uh, some of the best lawyers in America. And tonight we have Bobby Prince. He's a great one. He's been alumnus of the year for the University of Alabama. Um, in several categories, has done great things for the University of Alabama for decades. He uh, was the coach for the trial team. He's been president of the Alabama Trial Lawyers Association and has done great work throughout. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, he turned my head when, like, he got this three and a half million dollar trucking verdict against a trucking company uh, years ago down in Tuscaloosa, and also when he got this 15.5 million dollar. Uh, verdict against a trucking company and, and over the years he, has, he and his firm have specialized in that. You've met his couple of partners, there are more lawyers in the firm, but you've met a couple of his partners, uh, Matt Glover and Josh Hayes and they're good ones. Well this is their boss, their mentor, Bobby Prince, and he recruited them from the University of Alabama because he was their school teacher. And so you know like Bear Bryant said, you try to recruit those who are smarter than you are. And so you can make your own judge of that tonight when you talk to or hear Bobby Prince speak. He's a great one. He's done a magnificent job. Um, he too played a little football at Alabama. That's important, ladies. You know, you got to mention that we were talking about the book written by Robert Bailey called The Professor, which is, I hope, going to be a big hit. And uh, it's important here. But Bobby Prince enjoys an AV rating, which is the highest you can get, um, by Martin Dellen Hubble. And he's married to a lawyer. He and his wife, Dina, have four daughters. And uh, Mary Elizabeth, Courtney, Will Willis, and Grace, they go to the First Methodist Church where they're very devout Christians and very, uh, uh, they do a lot of great things. In fact, I tried to get Bobby Prince to stay at my house tonight and spend the night. He said, no, I've got to lead a prayer breakfast in the morning at 6.30 for about 800 people. So he said, I'm busy. And... Uh, Really, he wants to go watch the Kentucky game. And, uh, yeah, so he's admitted to practice in Florida. He's a specialist in all areas of trial law, but, but uh, personal injury and wrongful death have been his specialty. And thank you so much uh, for being here tonight and being with us this entire season. And I present to you Mr. Bobby Prince. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. Hang on one second. Always good to see you. Um, you know, I don't ever think that I'm reaching my full maturity until I hear somebody like Alan introduce me. And then I remember how long it's been since we um, were in law school together. Right, Alan? Um, I do want to thank the people of law school for inviting me back. Uh, I always enjoy coming up here. It's such a great ride. You get to see nature and this time of year. Got dogwoods blooming. It's just wonderful out there. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, chit-chat with you guys. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 18-wheelers. My office named it on the road again from the song, no doubt. Um, I want to start with the end of it. The end of it is the courtroom scene. Because that's when you take the cake out of the oven. But trust me, there is a lot of effort and things that go on behind the scenes before you ever get to that courtroom. <clears throat> Most counties, it takes about a year. Uh, Birmingham, sometimes it takes a little bit more uh, because of the population there. <clears> There's <throat> three things you have to do. Some of this may be redundant to you. Uh, if so, treat it as a refresher course. Uh, three things that the plaintiff must prove. One, that somebody had a collision and that during that collision, fault was on the other driver. Let's talk about the truck driver since this is 18-wheeler. The truck driver, like all drivers, has a duty to drive reasonably, just like you do, like I do, and they do too. So if they don't, they can be at fault. Number two, you got to have damages, but number three is the most difficult one. Number three is those damages have to be connected to that wreck. Now that may sound simple to you, but Defense lawyers are very good, and they're very good at creating questions about those damages. Either they say either we embellish them or we already had them. Okay, <clears throat> there are your three things, liability, causation, and 
damages. What happens though? The wreck just occurred. Um, there you are, or there a person is, in behind their little passenger car, and they've just collided with an 18-wheeler. So what I wanted you to know what the driver of the car does, what the driver of the truck does. The driver of the car is probably incapacitated. Most of the time they are unconscious or knocked almost unconscious. So they're taking, you can see on the right side, they're taking for medical treatment right after the wreck and they're admitted to the hospital their condition is generally confused and sometimes amnesic they don't remember what happened all right let's switch to the truck driver what's the truck driver doing would it surprise you to know that when the wheels on that truck stop the first thing that driver does which is what he is trained and instructed to do is to call the home office. I notice I didn't say call 911. I notice I didn't say get out and check for injuries. The first thing they are trained and told to do, call home. ET, call home first. So they do. They're trained to do that. They're trained to speak only to the trooper. Don't be volunteering information, Mr. Truck Driver. And when you talk to the trooper and he says what happened, do not admit fault. You can tell him your version of what happened. Do not admit fault. Sometimes they take photographs with their iPhone or some of them have those little throwaway cameras in their truck. The ch cheaper ones you can buy, they take photographs. Now, why are they doing this? I mean, now, not all of them do this, but the things I'm telling you tonight are based on our experience in our law firm. Uh, Matt Glover and Josh Hayes and Cole Baxter, Blake Williams and I have all encountered these things I'm telling you. Didn't read them in a book. We got them through depositions. We got them through witness statements and that sort of thing. Well, what's the purpose of calling back to the home office? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> The, the plaintiff, the one that's brought the lawsuit, the injured party, that's you. You're in the hospital dealing with your injuries. Trucking company and their insurance company send what we call a SWAT team to the scene. And trust me, they don't take long to get there. We had a case where they beat the trooper to the scene. They beat the highway patrolman to the scene of the wreck. Now, what kind of SWAT team? Well, it can be lots of different people, um, and I'm going get to get to that, but the SWAT team comes, they take witnesses, they advise the truck driver, they help him with his statement to the police, <clears throat> and uh, incredibly, the, some of the office people, the company people, drive the truck driver for his alcohol and drug tests. We've had that happen, where they drive them down to the hospital. See, they have to be mandatorily tested. There's a fatality. Of course, usually the trooper's there for that, and he'll take them to the hospital. But on an injury case, we've had examples where they take them. Now, you know, you hope that everybody's honest. You hope that, you know, it's his urine, it's his blood. Uh, I'm just saying they take him. Who, look who makes up the SWAT team. I was amazed by this. I mean, you might think they might send one person. They don't send one person. They send, we found the safety director there before. We have found the, an engineer, of course, an investigator, accident reconstruction person with a background, and lawyer. How about that one? The defense lawyer that actually tries the case, has, we've had cases where they have been at the scene while the ambulance is taking the injured person away. SWAT team is there. So what are they doing there? What do they do? Well, look down at the bottom. They take photographs. They interview witnesses. They get information. Um, incredibly, they remove personal items from the truck. That's what they call them, personal items. The driver's personal items. We had a case, we had a case where logbooks were missing. 
We asked the trooper, you know, the log book's a federal requirement. They've got to log in their miles, their trips. <clears throat> we asked the state trooper. He said, you know, I climbed up in the truck. I couldn't find the log books. They weren't in there. We asked the driver, where are your log books? I don't know. In the truck. We asked the company, where are those log books? We don't know. We didn't see any log books. This went on for months and months until we finally got those log books. And they were pristine. <laughs> I mean, you know, you could imagine the truck driver who's, you know, he's in a hurry or she's in a hurry and she's trying to eat and she's behind on her log book. And a lot of times their entry's not made. Not this one. Perfect times, events. Somebody filled it in. But look at the last one. Black box. I don't know those trucks have a, you know, a lot of passenger cars have them, but trucks have a black box. Those things are amazing. The newer the truck, the more information they record. They, but even older trucks record things like the distance away from the wreck that the driver took his foot off the gas. It measures when he put his foot, or she did, on the brake. It tells what the engine was doing. The RPM, I mean, it, there's very little that those black boxes today can't tell you. One, I'll just give you one example of a case we had. <clears throat> um, SWAT team got down there first. Of course, we know we're, we're not there. But anyway, we, as an afterthought, I mean, after the wreck, we said, okay, tell us about the black box. Their answer to us under oath was, truck doesn't have a black box. This one is a, like a, you know, a model that didn't have one. And we, we uh, checked with our expert and checked with the manufacturer, and they said, yeah, it's got one. So we write them back. We said, whoa, 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 you got one on there. What would what, you do with the information? Now what they do, y'all, is they take a laptop to the scene, plug it into the truck, download the stuff off the black box. Okay, they got the information. And if that truck gets back in service, it records over that. If they repair that truck and put it back on the road, after a certain time, all that stuff's gone, the, the data from the wreck. <clears throat> Yeah, question. So what happens with all that information? Now, how do you, how do you all recover that information and so forth? Well, <clears throat> we do something called discovery. That's actually something I've got planned to talk about if we have time. But I'll go ahead and tell you right now. In a lawsuit, <clears throat> the theory is both sides get to discover facts. That's what we call it, discovery. Well, there are a lot of methods. First method is you can send written questions for them to answer under oath. Now, you can see the problem with that. The problem is the lawyer is going to help them answer those questions. So they've got 30 days to answer. The second way is we ask them to produce documents, all, any kind of documents, maintenance records on the truck, repair records on the truck after the wreck, black box information, okay? So then the third thing after we get the documents, we're entitled to have somebody from the trucking company who is most knowledgeable about the truck or who's most knowledgeable about the black box, come and sit down with us at a designated place, designated time, under oath, and we get to ask them questions. Follow-up questions, not like those written interrogatories. This time, the lawyer can't answer. The, the, the safety director has, has to answer, or whoever it is, and we say, did you go to the scene? Did you have somebody? Yes. Did you get the information from the black box? And they were saying no. Remember now, they started off saying, no, we didn't have one. No black box. And we said, well, yes, you did. They said, okay, well, we had a black box, but it did not record the kind of information you wanted, the speed and all that. We said, yes, it did. I mean, this takes time back and forth. We said, yes, here are the specs on it. It does do that. And they go, you know, you're right. It, it does, but, but that truck was taken down about four miles down the road and it was repaired. And the guy down there, he opened that black box and got that information and you can't do that because it destroys it. And he didn't know any better. So we go down to the repairman. We said, did you do that? And he goes, no. A trained expert has to take that stuff out. I, I, I know not to mess with it. We write him back. He said he didn't do that. Y'all got the information. So eventually, eventually we got the information telling us speed of the driver. And once we got it, we figured out why they did not want us to see it because the driver was speeding. 
And so that, you know, messed them up. But it, look, it's a war. And not all trucking companies and not all insurance companies do what I just told you. But some of them do. And you don't ever know when you're going to have that come up. So the lawyer, the, who you get as a lawyer, whether you get our firm or some other firm, it's got to be somebody that won't quit digging. They've got to continue to dig because they will hide that pea under that shell as long as they can. Why? Because the government makes them take, <clears throat> have $750,000 on those trucks. Us on dry cargo, if it's oil, wet, you know, liquid, it's a million dollars. There's a lot of money at stake. They're not about to turn it over to us. Okay, so while they're SWAT team. Yes. How did they take the driver away from the scene without being released with law enforcement for the blood test? Yeah, yeah. The well, law enforcement, all they, what those people do, unless there's a fatality now, they come out and they get the statements and everything. Once he gives that statement, they're through with him. Because see, it's a DOT, it's a Department of Transportation requirement that they be tested. If there's uh, injuries or fatality, I believe the other one is if a, one of the cars are disabled to the point it has to be towed, they're supposed to mandatorily test them. They're also supposed to test them prior to employment. They're also sp supposed to test them randomly during employment. But all this is, um, you're on the honor system. I mean, the government doesn't have the money or the personnel to come and hover over a trucking company and say, well, did you do random testing? They ask the trucking companies to submit the information. And they lie about it a lot of times. Uh, I would say most of the time. Yes? When, do you, when <clears throat> does an insurance company call you for the plaintiff in this? Uh, mm -hmm. How soon does that <clears throat> usually take place? Well, that's what I'm, that, look at this next slide. While the SWAT team is doing their, their job that I just told you about, what is your law firm doing? Zero. Zilch, nothing. Why not? You're in the hospital. You're not dealing with something. That's if you, if you survive the crash. If you don't survive the crash, your heirs are all upset, confused. They're not about to hire a lawyer quickly. But let's say you survive it. You've got your mind on everything but that. See, we can't go out there without your permission. We have to be hired before we can go out there. So why do people not hire a lawyer quickly enough? <clears throat> Here's some. <clears throat> Number one, you're dead or incapacitated. You just can't do it. Two, your heirs are all confused, and they can't do it or won't do it. Here's one we run into a lot. Look at number three. Well, I didn't hire y'all because the insurance man, he was so nice. He came by and told us at the hospital, look, anything that's not covered on your medical bills, don't you worry, we're going to pay that. Don't you worry, you don't have to worry about one thing except getting well. He seemed so nice, he said our bills would be taken care of, he said he would, he would make us a settlement and he would be fair to us. That's what he told us. And then he said, besides, if you get a lawyer, they just take a percentage of your money. A lot of folks don't hire lawyers because of that. Of course, what he's not telling them is, I, I honestly cannot remember one case I have ever had in my legal career where it, it, first of all, if I thought I couldn't benefit you more than the adjuster offered you, I won't take your case. I won't take your case. I mean, how much repeat business would I get? You just, I mean, a client would go out and tell somebody, oh, Prince, all he does is just get your money. I'm not about to have that. First of all, I want to help you. There are a lot of lawyers that like helping people. Now, I'm not saying I don't like money. I do, but I like to help people too. So we don't, you know, we always make you a net winner or we don't take your case. I, I, look, I had one case. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and tell a lot of war stories. But I had one where they, this lady got rear-ended and this, um, this piece of equipment came through the, the, from the pickup behind her, threw her uh, back window, hit her in the head, hurt her. You know, concussion, hurt her neck. Uh, they, uh, the adjuster offered her, I think it was $20,000. We got his file. We got his file because we sued him for bad faith. We settled the case for, I think, two or 300000 This was about 20 years ago. All right? In the file, it said, <clears throat> well, we, we've got authority to settle for 35000 but I made her an offer for twenty. In other words, he didn't even make her the full offer. 
He sat on the money, ran her to a lawyer, came to us. Then all of a sudden, the value of the case went up to 125000 or something. It was well over a hundred. Saying this law firm is, you know, has a record of, of um, being successful in the courtroom, blah, blah, blah. And we settled it later on for, you know, look how much, ten times what they offered her. See, they didn't want her to go to get a lawyer. They were trying to tell her, uh, we're being fair to you, but she sniffed it out. She smelled a rat. All right, a lot of folks, look at the next one, thinks that there's just a stigma against hiring a lawyer, suing. I mean, the Republicans, bless their hearts, have done a great job, the big oil companies, big insurance companies, of convincing the public that trial lawyers are all greedy. We just want your money. We just want to sue. It's like a, go in the courtroom and get a big verdict. You know, so a lot of folks, because of that, don't like to sue. And then look at the last one, and I hate to even have this, but in fairness, I've got to put it up there. A lot of times, there are so many lawyers that are directly contacting people in the hospital, cold calls to represent them, that you just get turned off. I don't blame you. I, I wish that our profession would police that better. It's, it's a disgrace, but it happens, and I'm sorry for it. But a lot of folks can't decide which lawyer because they got so many law firms contacting them. Okay, you're now two months after the collision. You're at home. You're still in therapy. And the adjusters call and made you an offer that is substantially lower than what your neighbor got. I just made this up as an example. It's lower than the neighbor got, and he only hurt, like broke his arm or something when you were in the hospital for months. And so you now know that they're not going to treat you right. In fact, do y'all know that Alan and lawyers like Alan and our firm were able to get a hold of a memo from a national insurance company, I mean, as big as you can get, like Prudential, State Farm, the big ones, okay? And this particular insurance company, there were about three of them, but the first one to do it sent a memo around to, it was a, to the na national letter to their adjusters. And they said, we have decided to employ the 3D defense. Y'all heard about this? It took us years to get this memo. We finally got it in, out of a Kentucky judge. And they said, they telling them, they said, all right, first thing, the first D is we want you to deny the claim. Adjusters, forget who's at fault, deny the claim. Why? Because a lot of folks, when they get that from the adjuster, they just quit. They say, well, I I must have been my fault. They quit. Second thing they said is delay, delay. Promise them that you're going to do this, drag it out. Why? Because you get out of the hospital, your bills are stacked up here, you've been missing work, you got bill collectors, you need money. They know that you'll take 50 cents on the dollar if they drag it out. That's the second D. Then they said, but if they do get a lawyer and they do sue, then defend it. We can drag it out another year in court. People get nervous going to court, and they'll settle for less. The 3D defense. So, yep, <clears throat> I guess he did offer your neighbor more than he offered you. That must have been before they got the 3Ds going. <clears throat> Look at the next one. That during that two-month time, you've lost evidence. You've lost critical evidence. Those tire marks where the 18-wheeler slammed on his brakes, they're not there. On a busy intersection with traffic going by, rain coming through, they erase those things, believe it or not. They go away over time. Witnesses. <clears throat> Suppose you got a good witness. Two months later, I just put down, for instance, he's been enlisted. <laughs> she got drafted. She moved. She had a stroke. She died. I don't know. Evidence gets cold sometimes. Witnesses get lost. And that black box, I told you, it's back in service. It's been recorded over. That information's gone. So there are lots of <clears throat> negative reasons to delay hiring a lawyer. Don't let the insurance companies spend a bunch of money and get ads on TV or direct mail to you saying, you know, lawyers are bad. They just want to take your money. They're doing it for a reason. They're not doing that to help you. They're doing it to help 
themselves. When you finally do get around to hiring a lawyer, this is a picture of our firm. And in fact, we've got another lawyer, Blake Williams, that should be on there. But we've got investigators. We've got Josh. I think y'all met him. Matt's on there. Uh, Cole Baxter. These are all good lawyers. In fact, the female to my right is the smartest lawyer in my family. That would be my wife, Dina. <laughs> and she is a, an excellent lawyer. Um, okay, what does law firm do for you? Well, we gather information. You ask about discovery, that's what we do. We go out immediately and start um, gathering witness statements. We take photographs of the scene. We try to find the vehicles involved. Then we prepare the summons and complaint and we file it. Uh, we send a letter to the company, the trucking company, saying we call it a protection letter to preserve and protect the information. Don't get rid of it. We want, we want to have it. Uh, and we begin those discovery processes, you know, interrogatories, written question, motions to produce, deposition notice, and then finally, if it gets that far, we sit down with you and go over mediation with you, your deposition, you know, you don't do anything without full um, disclosure, without full assistance from the lawyers, uh, including the trial. Okay, any questions so far? All right, yep. Some of that would be <clears throat> going out and, and messing with the black box would be kind of tampering with the evidence type thing. It wouldn't be allowed. That's right. That's right. It is tampering with the evidence. Um, <clears throat> Alabama has a law, and y'all pardon, I, I'm sorry I'm so hoarse tonight, but the pollen's been after me. <clears throat> chase me up here to Huntsville. Alabama has a law that says that if you destroy or um, secrete, hide evidence so that the other party, it works both ways now, so if the other party does not have access to that information, the jury is entitled to know that. So there's a jury instruction where if you were the jury, you would be told this trucking company was asked to produce the evidence from the black box it was destroyed. And you can, members of the jury, take that into consideration in deciding whether the trucking company is guilty or not. So it's a pretty, I'm being mild to them in explaining this to you. It's actually worse than that. It's kind of a presumption that they're guilty. So it can be bad. But again, if you're dealing with the kind of money that, we, that you are in a trucking case, well, people get injured catastrophically. It's worth it to them to hide that the pee under the shell and make you find it and make the lawyers find it. If, if they had a cell phone and were talking on it when they had direct and they got out there and removed that, they could say they didn't have a cell phone. That's right, they could. And how, how did you handle that? <clears throat> well, okay, some law firms quit. You know, they, they get that interrogatory answer and they say, well, they didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> I can tell you what our, our firm's motto is. You know, if they, if they say it, it's probably not true. So we immediately, we immediately subpoena. You know, they will answer things like, well, who's your carrier? And they'll say AT&T. Now, we send a third-party subpoena to AT&T. Give us all the records on that trucking company from the date here to the date here on this driver. So we, we, we've got to keep digging. So once you get this verdict, how, how uh, hard is it for you to get the collection? Well, usually you can collect it, you know, because of the insurance. The mandatory insurance is pretty strong. It's sitting there. They have to have, if they're involved in interstate commerce, they have to have a quarter of a million, three quarters of a million in insurance. It's getting that verdict and holding it from the Supreme Court that's the problem. If you ever get a final judgment, you can get your money. We don't have a lot of, a lot of trouble with that. I will tell you this one uh, story. This uh, state trooper was... Uh, going down the road, and he saw this truck driver get out of his truck, parked over on the side of the road. He got out, and he went over, and he and took his fist and banged it on the side of the truck. The trooper said, what is he doing? And so he, you know, goes on down, and he stopped, and he said, I'm, I think I'm going to follow this guy. That's weird. He gets in behind him, and about five miles later, the truck driver pulls over, gets out, walks over there, and bangs hard as he could on the side of that truck. So the trooper's curiosity got the best of him. He pulled up to the driver and he said, hey, the driver was walking back to get in the cab. He said, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? He said, I saw you banging on the side of that truck. 
driver said, that's right. He said, I've got an 11-ton load of parakeets in here. And he keeps walking up to get in the cab, and the trooper said, so what? And the driver said, well, the weight limit on this road's 10 tons. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, things you need to know about 18 wheelers. You may already know some of this. They're big. They're heavy. They weigh. Here's the here's the 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 match. Here's the if you were a prize fighter, here's the match. One of the contestants weighs eight eighty thousand pounds loaded. The other one weighs on an average of three thousand pounds. Now, average. If you got a Dodge Durango or, you know, one of the SUVs, yeah, it's four, five, six thousand. Most cars are three thousand. Uh, a little um, Camry, thirty-two hundred pounds. Honda Civic, twenty-six hundred. So you can see it's around three thousand. Your car is about eighteen feet long. That truck is seventy feet long with a trailer. Uh, and they're, they're tall, they're high, <laughs> they're big. Y'all know, you see them on the interstate. Those things they can't stop them in time like you can. They can't turn them like, like we can turn our passenger cars. In a wreck, it's such a mismatch. You are lucky if you get out of that thing without going to the hospital in an ambulance. You're lucky. In most cases that we have, we don't see very many at all where somebody is just, I hurt my neck in a truck wreck. They're involved in numerous crashes every year. The statistic in 2011, 18 wheelers crashed 60,000 times. They're 40% of all reported wrecks. The National Transportation Board, Department of, you know, DOT, Department of Transportation, uh, keeps records on trucks and wrecks, fatalities in the year 2012. First of all, of all transportation modes, air, Water, highway, all, even pipeline. There were 35,000 fatalities in 2012. 94% involved the highway. 94% of all the fatalities of all transportation. Now, that's not all truck wrecks now. That involves motorcycles and pedestrians, but still, you know, truck wrecks are a large percentage of it. <clears throat> A new trend has developed with these iPhones and, and personal uh, phones and that sort of thing, and that's distraction. You know, we have recently in Alabama passed a law that says you can't text while you drive. We still allow you to talk on the phone. Some states don't. And the reason they don't is there's been an epidemic for about the last seven or eight years of distraction. People taking their eyes off the road. They're not intoxicated. They're not on pills. They're texting. Are they looking at this screen? You know, checking an email? I, I don't know. But in 2012, there were over 3,000 wrecks attributed solely to distraction, injuring 421,000 people. Now, Alabama was one of the 13. There's only 13 states that had a reduction in deaths, and we were one of them, and we're to be thankful for that. <clears throat> Here's a good statistic for you. 2013 through March of this year, if you look at the years 209, 210, 211 in the far left-hand corner, I mean column, you can see the truck wrecks go up 2,900 to 3,200 to 3,300. So large trucks in fatalities are increasing. Injury, same thing, large trucks, I think it's the fourth column from the right, 51,000, 56,000, 60,000. <clears throat> what are the causes of them? These statistics right here are reported by drivers of the trucking company. Here's what they say. Here's the top ten, David Letterman style. Seven of them, seven of them involve driver error. Now they admit to this when they, they say what caused this crash. Um, things like traveling too fast for the condition, driver unfamiliar with the roadway, over-the-counter drug use, Inadequate surveillance, in other words, he couldn't see over the hill. Fatigue, driver made an illegal maneuver, driver inattention, seven of the ten driver errors. 
excuse me, the highway safety uh, charted this. Near misses, I love that. And then a, a, a wreck, and then a, almost a wreck within the last week. 26% added together. In one week time, this is the truckers, the 26% of them admit to having a wreck or almost a wreck. 40% of them admit to being drowsy or sleepy or, or asleep behind the wheel in the last week. They, of course, they crash. 47% of them had at least one crash last year in a year's time. 22% of them had at least one moving violation, and 5% of them had more than that. So 22% had moving violations. 47 had crashes or near crashes. <clears throat> this, this is a sad statistic. And 186 fatalities, <clears throat> 186 deaths, 67% of the drivers were found to be impaired by alcohol or drugs. 33% <clears throat> of them tested positive for alcohol or psych psychoactive drugs. Cocaine was the leader. And 7% admitted to, to amphetamines or were tested for them. Now, it doesn't take a math wizard to know that that's over 100%. That's 107% because there was a lot of duplication. Alcohol plus cocaine plus amphetamines. So it was a, it's a definite problem in fatalities. Now, again, my father was a truck driver. All truck drivers are not bad people. All of them are not addicted to drugs or drinking alcohol, driving behind the wheel. But too many of them are. That's the point. Killing people. <clears throat> driver fatigue is another one. 40% Factor. It's a factor in 40% of all big truck wrecks. It's a direct cause of 15% of the fatalities and injuries. You know, 750 people died directly because of it. Um, now, the trucking company, just I'm going to just give you just a little brief, uh, not history, but, you know, the authority to regulate them is the Department of Transportation. I mentioned that. And in the department, you're going to see this um, this term right here, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. They regulate trucks on the highway. And they do it through two acts. One was in 84, one was in 86. The Motor Carrier Safety Act of 84, the Commercial Motor Vehicle Act of 1986. Now what they do, they pass regulations that govern everything related to trucks. Drivers, health, <laughs> testing, you know, reporting, trucks, maintenance, everything. If they put the truck on the road, it's for our safety now. They regulate them. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, the trucking companies are supposed to follow these regs. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't. The first act covered trucks over 10,000 pounds. The second one in 86 covered trucks over 26,000 pounds. Or they transport 16 of us or if they do hazardous materials, carry those. If they drop down to the bottom, if they get two serious traffic violations in a three-year period, they're, they're to be suspended for 60 days. If they get three or more in that three-year period, their license is revoked for 120 days. Recently, and this is good news, and this was fought by a lot of you know, organizations, I don't know why, but recently we changed the hours of service. The and it's, it takes an act of Congress, literally. These bills are promoted, they're advertised, people get to complain about them. It takes months and years. We reduced, the government did, from 82 hours a week down to 70 hours a week now for the limit for a driver of a truck. They've got, they, they can go 70 hours, but then if they rest 34 hours, half that time roughly, they can resume. They're required 30 minute break during a first eight hour shift. Yeah. Now, is that for a driver team or an individual driver? That's an individual driver. Um, now, they did not change the 11 hour daily limit. They did not change the 14 hour work day, but they did change the number of consecutive hours that you could drive a truck. I don't know how they figured this last one, but don't you look at that. They estimate that it will save 19 lives a year and prevent 1,400 crashes 
and prevent 560 injuries. I don't know how they come up with that, but I'm, I'm happy to know that, you know, that that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> I mentioned the trucking company's reporting. How good of a job do they do? Well, I'm going to show you one from a case that we handle. This is the driving record of this driver that <clears throat> caused a, a, a wreck with our client. Did you look at that? During that period from 84 to 210, now he, was, he drove. He was suspended 22 times. He was involved in 12 wrecks. He had 76 citations. He had a DUI on his record. It's unbelievable that they would continue to put this man on the road, but they did. We've got that record in our file. <clears throat> what can be done about it? There is some good news on the horizon. First of all, technology. Technology. You remember those driving logs I mentioned? <clears throat> We're now going, some of the truck, trucking companies are going to a system where it's electronically sent in to the company. The driver won't even have to figure out, you know, fill out those logs. So technology is big. I'm going to mention that in just a second of some other companies. But the second thing is us. Us. <clears throat> we can prevent a lot of the wrecks by not swerving in front of them by following too close behind. Y'all, have you heard about the ozone, no zone, ozone, the no zone areas? <clears throat> well, their truckers and the government have got together, studied this, and they said there's four areas, no zone. You do not need to be in that zone. Why? They can't see you. 18-wheelers don't have a rear view mirror. They got side mirrors. You pull up behind the 18-wheeler on the interstate. If you're so close to him that you cannot see his side mirrors, he has no idea you're there. He can't see you. If you're too close in front of him, he can't see you because he's looking down. What? Getting back to the uh, other thing about the driving hours and everything, mm -hmm. the experience on what their pay is, a lot of that has an incentive for the pay for the number of hours. <clears throat> They're driving, my friend. Yes, and yes, you are. And companies put a lot of pressure on those drivers to get that load down there, get back, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the driver wants to make more money. But, yeah, the trucking companies actually contribute to the problem. Uh, and a lot of them used to be they were paid by the mile. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But anyway, uh, look at that. Stay, if you're going 70, stay seven car lengths behind them. If you pass them, now, this came from a friend of mine. We were driving to Birmingham one time. He's a trucker. <clears throat> and I pulled up on the back left wheel of this 18-wheeler, and we were talking. And he said, you need to pass. I said, I'm passing. He said, you know, you need to pass. I said, okay. So I mashed on the gas, got around, and I said, I was passing. He said, mm-mm. He said, he can't see you at all back there on that back when you, where you were. It's a blind zone. He said he switches lanes, he'd knock us off the interstate. So if you pass, pass on the left and pass. Get on around. <clears throat> you know, I haven't seen that yet, but, but technology's there already. We've got them on our cars. The technology's out there. Let me show you what, you, what, um, what we call this eye in the sky, how technology is tracking truckers now. One, these are different companies, uh, like that telematics. You, they can track the trailer using GPS, the tractor trailer. They know where they are. We've had that case where we wanted to know where this truck driver was. He, he abandoned his route and went somewhere else. I mean, it's, I, I can't talk a lot about it because we're under confidentiality order, confidentiality order, but that's how we've helped prove the case. We got their GPS records, and he was off his route, and they weren't checking on him. Um, the, the intelligent vehicle technologies is a sensor that they can put on the truck to let them know if they are too close to you or another truck. Uh, look, look at this one. Uh, Tellogis is a software that monitors braking and the location. They can sit at the home office and tell when a truck breaks. Um, and then, of course, that awareness technologies monitors all data from a cell phone, like if a truck trucking company gives that driver a cell phone, then they know immediately if he's taking photographs, if he's texting, if he's using it. So the technology is going to help us. It's going to save a lot of lives. Yep, question. 
I know these uh, violations are spread over 36 years and I'm sure over a lot of different jurisdictions too, but is there no state uh, uh, clearing house limit on how many uh, times you're suspended or? Oh, well, there are lots of department of, there are a lot of department of regulation, you know, department of transportation regulations on how many times, yes, there are, but that doesn't mean, see there was, I noticed in researching for this talk, there is a proposed rule right now where they're gonna have a clearing house. We don't have a central location for all the records from all the different trucking companies to come together so that we can know if somebody got a DUI in Montana and got one in Arizona the next year. Right now, we don't have that capacity. Like as plaintiff lawyers, we have to, it's very methodical and it's kind of, we have to inch our way. We take the deposition, who all of you work for? And then we start sending subpoenas across the country until we, we have to put the puzzle pieces together. But there's no one place we can go and say, hey, what's the driver's record here? But yeah. <clears throat> I have a question. Can a witness statement be changed? The reason being, I was hit by a semi truck mm -hmm. and I'd have a new replacement. And the witnesses said my daughter was driving, of course, I was driving. She was insured, there was no problem. And the officer asked my grandkids, and they said, no, my Nana was driving. And they changed that part, but they still looked at my fault, and I was behind the line and just sitting there when he hit me. Well, yes, they can change. First of all, the, the police report is not admissible into evidence at a trial. It's hearsay because the trooper was not there. See, we, he was not a witness. He has no first-hand knowledge. He all has second-hand knowledge. He comes up to the scene, and, you know, again, if you're injured and gone to the hospital, a lot of times they don't get your statement. I was in a, a rural area, and I wouldn't go to the hospital, but I went to my doctor and had out surgery. Okay, yeah. Well, so first of all, the, the document is not admissible. Okay. That's number one. Number two, we have been successful, and I know other firms too, but we've been successful in getting that officer to do a supplemental report and change it. You, we, so it is possible, yes, including fault. Now, i tell you who uses these insurance companies. They, they look at them and they go by them and they, they use them against us. You know, they'll say, whoa, your, your driver was faulted here. I was still behind them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we've had several where we've flipped them, you know. And, and not just us. Other law firms can do that. You just have to work at it, gather up the information, present it to the trooper. And sometimes they won't, but usually they will. I was just afraid they'd give a ticket every time I went through it. <laughs> well, they might. That's, <laughs> that's a possibility. So yeah. if the police officer assigns blame for the wreck in his report, mm -hmm. that's not admissible? Not admissible. Is that a black mark against you? Uh, it's only a black mark against you in that, that they won't pay the claim. In other words, if, if the trooper puts down or the policeman puts down you at fault and it was not your fault, well, the insured driver, you know, the insurance company for the other driver will say, we're not paying you ill gear. It was your fault. That's where it hurts you the most. But as far as the lawsuit, it, it doesn't hurt you because the trooper can't come in and testify. Now, they're about whose fault it was. There, there is one exception to that, and that is some of the troopers now are being trained as accident reconstruction people. And if he has that qualification... And if he did an accident reconstruction, then he can give his opinion about things like speed and direction and, you know, so yes, but not all of them have that. And usually they can't, they can't testify about it at all. Okay. Now I mentioned the no zone. There it is, 70 uh, feet in front. There are the four zones. Stay away from those zones. If you don't listen to anything else that I say tonight, this can save your life. They can't see you. They don't know you're there in heavy traffic. They don't have any idea you're there. Okay, here's some, just some measurements that I thought might be interesting for you. Um, <clears throat> you know, how big are trucks? How big are cars? How big is the road? <coughs> Lanes, y'all may know of some of this stuff. 12 feet wide. Cars? Generally, five and a half feet wide, so roughly half the distance of a lane. You've got about three feet on each side if you're in the middle of your lane. Trucks, on the other hand, eight feet wide and 13 and a half feet tall. 
on dry pavement going 40 miles per hour, it takes the truck 25% longer in time, in time to stop. It's a good rule of thumb, 25% longer than you in a passenger car. Here's why. <clears throat> Here's how you can, uh, it's pretty, I just think it's interesting. I don't know if you'll go home and apply it, but you can always tell your feet per second that you're traveling. It's a very simple formula. You take your speed, take half of it, add them together. If you're going 60, half of 60 is 30. 30 plus 60 is 90. You're going 90 feet per second. It's the easy way to remember it. Half of your speed added to your speed. All right? Whatever your speed is. Well, what that means is if you're going 70, then you're going, I think that's 105 uh, feet per second. Three seconds is a football field. You turn your eyes off that road, look down at your cell phone for three seconds, you might as well, we might as well blindfold you and let you go the length of a football field in your car. You have no idea what's, you know, you might know when you took your eyes off, but a lot can happen in those three to five seconds. That's just three seconds. The average time to look down at your cell phone and te on a text message is actually five seconds, according to the government. But there are studies. Five seconds. So that means almost two football fields blindfolded. That's why it's pretty easy for us to see why we have to have laws that says you cannot text and drive. But it doesn't stop there. Even using a phone, period, in a car, all the studies are starting to show now that you're impaired as much as if you were intoxicated. You just can't, you know, you can't control your car. A thing's going too fast. You don't have stopping distances. And it can, that's, causing a lot of truck, uh, truck wrecks too. In fact, <clears throat> I, I see I only have like about five more minutes. I want to tell you this, Obama, President Obama in 2009, texting and distractions were such an uh, issue that he banned them, executive order. He didn't wait on Congress. He said, if you're in a government vehicle, you cannot text and use your phone. You can't do it. Even if you're in your private car, in your own government business, no texting at all. That's, and, and they encourage all companies who have contracts with the government to issue policies against texting. So we're, we're starting to realize this is a huge problem that we've got. It's a new problem, a new one. It's no longer the DUI, no longer that. It's a... It's a teenager and an adult that has takes their eyes off that road you know you could be I was thinking about this the other day I mean like y'all know life is so precious and it seems like we're, you know we're not here for any time at all but somebody on a two-lane road they look down at that phone and they cross that line and hit you head on they're sober you're sober it's a huge problem um, one of the more startling statistics that I saw was one in five teenagers say that texting does not impair them. I mean, I would have, hey, back when I was a teenager, it would have probably been 50%, okay? I mean, I'm not singling them out. I'm just saying when you're that young, you know, you just think you're bulletproof. And they think, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Well, you're not good, you know. And, hey, 10% of the adults, you know, text and, and, and drive and cause wreck. 10% of us admit to it or get caught by it. Well, one final thing. I've been jumping on the truckers a lot. Um, there's actually, some of these things apply to them too. There's been uh, an increase in truck drivers being killed. Not necessarily by us, but by inattention. And look at that. Two out of five workplace deaths. Two out of five are related to trucking companies. We had a case recently where the driver, the, the cab, the top caved in so and on him. So you're starting to see this. There are just not that many government regulations on those big trucks as far as their safety, their occupant safety like ours. Okay, <clears throat> I've got lots more, but they're saying, they're waving the time bell on me back there. I've enjoyed it. I always do when I come up here. I hope you learned something. 
And I hope I've at least stirred your curiosity.